Well, el welcome to episode uh, negative three of the LearningMeasure.tv podcast. As we said at the beginning, these first few podcasts were to sort of work out the bugs, and boy, did we have bugs in this one. It tr this was our first attempt at an interview, and unbeknownst to us, one of our two microphones we were using was malfunctioning. We will get a new microphone before the uh, uh, next time we try an interview, but uh, as a result, we had to do a lot of messing in uh, the editing to try to make it understandable. So we'll do that next, but keep in mind the quality is pretty bad. But, uh, oh, by the way, I'm, again, David Archer, owner of LearningMeasure.tv and LearningMeasure.com. This first interview is uh, an interview with a member of our consultant network who wants to do some consulting work. And uh, so you can consider this a, maybe a job interview for if you're looking for consulting work. Okay, the other thing about this podcast, the second part on the antenna measurements had to be reshot a few times because of, well, for one thing, used the wrong microphone. Uh, another, there was also problems with the, the image quality. Hopefully we'll fix that uh, uh, in our next attempt. Um, well, here's the interview. And, uh, now we're going to do an interview with uh, uh, Eckerd Natter, um, one of our consultants. Um, why don't you start, tell us something about yourself. Uh, where do you come from? Well, I have been in this country for 40 years, and as you will realize from my pronunciation of the English language, I wasn't born here. So, uh, I emigrated in 67 and have been busy as an engineer ever since then. I, my, I worked for about, uh, let's say, 14 years for a company in Fort Lauderdale, Bendix Avionics Division, designed radars for small uh, private aircraft, and uh, then I moved to California, worked for Sperry for, I think, two or three years, designed again radars for small aircraft, <coughs> and then I went to the work for the government. There clearly was more money on, on that side. Can you tell us a little bit maybe about where you went to school? School, well, it's difficult to compare the European system of educating young people to the American system. Over there, I went through grade school. I wasn't really uh, uh, an excellent student. My father realized that and he said, son, I don't know if you're going to complete college, therefore I'm going to send you first to apprenticeship. And I spent uh, three and a half years uh, learning the craft, so to say. It started out with welding and metal shop and it progressed and eventually we built our own radios. Uh, my, uh, the apprenticeship years were spent with the uh, German airline, Lufthansa. Uh, after apprenticeship, I went through an engineering school in Hamburg, got my degree there in 1967, and worked, started to work for Lufthansa again. But there was an opportunity right away to go to America as a factory representative to Bendix Avionics. Well, I did that. I was supposed to come home after a year. The problem was there were these young girls with convertible Mustangs around, and they had me smitten. <laughs> so I stayed, became a citizen, eventually wound up working for the, uh, our government here for various uh, companies. Um, okay, yeah, what, what kind of uh, consulting jobs are you looking for at this point? Well, 
My background is in analog design. I'm, I'm pretty good at that. I am a good power supply designer, but I think my best background is in microwave hardware design and the maintenance of radar systems, radar modulators, radar transmitters. I spent 10 years out on the Pacific Missile Range on a small island uh, called Kwajalein. It's right in the middle between Hawaii and Australia, Brisbane, to be precise. Yeah. Uh, I maintained and upgraded there the Tradex radar, which has two transmitters, one at L-band and one at S-band. Uh, the transmitters are based on huge klystrons. Each one has uh, at least a megawatt peak power of RF output. The L-band radar has a duty cycle of 10%. And when you look at such a transmitter, you wind up with a power supply that was designed in the uh, late 50s, early 60s. And it's as big as a two-story uh, single-family home. And uh, uh, what kind of, how often are you what kind of hours are you looking for? Oh, I'm, I'm getting close to the mid-60s. I'm really not interested in a full-time 40-hour-a-week position. I'm probably looking for short-term assignments. I don't know, should I talk about where my resume can be found? <laughs> Why don't you make well, that pitch? I'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> well, um, Okay, how about this? Why uh, you talk, what? Um, why an engineer? That's a good question. I really don't know why, but I'm very glad that I became an engineer. For all those that want to get into engineering, I tend to explain it in in a little bit crass fashion. The bullshit factor in engineering is very low, lower than in many other professions. Uh, it's still there. <laughs> but yeah, there is some, always, yeah, yeah. But uh, compared to marketing or sales or whatever you want, it's, you can always, in, in, in science or in engineering, you can always uh, go down to the basics and ask people, show me how it works. There is a right answer, usually. <laughs> There's always a right, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but, okay. Um, uh, you can find uh, X uh, resume on the learningmeasure.com website. Uh, just go to the About Us, select consultants, and then you can see um, You'll see his picture, click on his resume, and it'll come up. Uh, if you're interested in anything that, uh, if you, in hiring Eck or getting his uh, advice, uh, uh, send us an email at info at learningmeasure.com and we'll get back with you. Um, anything else you want to add to this? Or? No, I don't think so. I think we covered it. Okay. Um, well, that's it for the interview and then uh, for this next section we'll go over some antenna stuff. Okay, now the future portion about uh, antenna measurements promised last week. First of all I want to mention a lot of the terms that are used in antenna measurements can be found in the IEEE standard 145-993 uh, IEEE standard definitions for terms of for for, uh, whoops, sorry, IEEE defin I, one more time. IEEE standard definitions for terms for antennas. Now we'll start out with the most obvious one. According to the IEEE, what's an antenna? Antenna, 
that part of a transmitting or receiving system that is designed to radiate or receive electric, ma electromagnetic waves. Um, fairly straightforward. It's meant to either send out electromagnetic waves or receive them. That's what an antenna is. There are all kinds of antennas, biconical antennas, log periodic dipoles, monopoles, uh, dipoles, bow tie antennas, horn antennas, double ridge waveguide horn antennas, patch antennas. There's just a, a large number of antennas that are out there. But in particular, we're going to talk first about a fictitious antenna called an isotropic radiator. Now, the IEEE defines an isotropic radiator as a hypothetical lossless antenna having equal radiation intensity in all directions. Basically, that means is that any power that's sensed on the antenna is radiated equally in all directions. You can't actually make an isotropic radiator. For one thing, um, electromagnetic waves are governed by what are called Maxwell's equations. And an isotropic radiator is not a solution to Maxwell's equations. There are other reasons why you can't have an isotropic radiator. One of my favorites to think about is electromagnetic waves are vector fields. They have magnitude and direction. You can't, in three dimensions, imagine uh, something that would uh, radiate equally in all directions with the same polarization. You can do that in two and four dimensions, but you can't do it in three, and we live in three, so you can't make one. Okay. One thing about the definition of a isotropic radiator, it talks about radiation intensity. The IEEE defines radiation intensity. In a given direction, the power radiated from an antenna per unit solid angle. So it's the, the radiation intensity is uh, power per steradian. Also, you can talk about the power per unit area incident in some, on some surface. But we're going to talk a little bit more about isotropic radiators. If you have some isotropic radiator at some point, just put my as a dot, and you put a sphere around it, of radius r, Okay, the, the total power incident on the antenna, let's say it's it delivered to the antenna, is P. Okay, the power per unit area, the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. Okay. So, at the surface of the square, sphere, the power incident is P, because conservation of energy says you can't create energy, and power is just the time rate of change of energy. So, we'll call this S, the power per unit area, is going to be the power radiated divided by 4 pi r squared. Now, Real antennas don't radiate equally in all directions. So, the, so you have a quantity called the gain of the antenna. Now the gain of an antenna is defined by the IEEE as um, the ratio of the radiation intensity in a given direction to the radiation intensity that would be obtained if the power accepted by the antenna were radiated isotropically. In the IEEE definition, there are five notes. Gain does not include losses arising from the impedance and polarization mismatches. Two, the radiation intensity corresponding to the isotropic radiated power is equal to the power accepted by the antenna divided by 4 pi. That's just this. If an antenna is without dissipated loss, then in any given direction, the gain is equal to its directivity, a term we'll talk about in a minute, directivity. Four. If the direction is not specified, the maximum of the radiation intensity is implied. In other words, if you talk about the gain of antenna, you're talking about the gain in the maximum direction. Okay, the term absolute gain is used in those instances, this number five, the abs term absolute gain is used in those instances where added emphasis is required to distinguish gain from relative gain. 
for example, absolute gain measurements. Okay, so gain, one of the things that that, that means then, okay, a an, an, an antenna, if you put a real antenna in here, let's say in this direction, the power is going to be the power of an isotropic radiator times what's called the gain. Okay, so in this case, let's say you just defined uh, let's say two angles. Uh, let's call this the x-axis for some reason. And we'll call this uh, uh, well. Let's let's do a normal 3D coordinate system. We'll do it this way. Make this the x-axis. This the y-axis. This the z-axis. So then you can define two angles phi and theta. So gain is a function of the two angles. Okay, and if you just have G there, that just means the maximum. Now if you radiate more power in this direction, that means there's some other direction where you're radiating less power. So the, the antenna pattern has some structure to it. So anyway, well, so if you have power per unit area of an antenna is P, G, T, We'll say that for pi r squared. I'm just repeating this. We'll call this the transmitted, transmit antenna gain. The area, the power received here, or incident on a, some square of area A, then, is this. The power received is the power transmitted times the gain transmitted or 4 pi r squared, that's the power per unit area, times the area. Okay, but we're, build, we're building up to something here. Now a real antenna will have some physical area, but it won't receive all power uh, equ uh, over its physical area equally well. It turns out, which means I will talk about it in another episode maybe, that there's, there's something called the equivalent area of an antenna. We'll, we'll call it, or effective area of antenna. It's equal to its gain times lambda squared, where that's the wavelength, over 4 pi. Okay. Now we can say when you, the, pow, the coupling of two, pow, the, the anten of two antennas, um, we'll get rid of this sphere for the moment, this drawing. You now have two antennas pointed at each other, let's say, or maybe not pointed at each other. One with the gain GT, the other with GR, and they're a distance R apart. Okay. The power received now, based on this, well, it's the power per unit area at the received antenna, which we've just shown is gt, well, ptgt over 4 pi r squared times the equivalent effective area of the receiving antenna, which is gr lambda squared over 4 pi. Rewriting this a little bit, it's ptgt gr lambda squared over 4 pi r squared, uh, whole quantity squared. This is a simplified form of what's called the free transmission equation. There are some terms missing. This is not including things like mismatch loss, polarization loss, uh, proximity effects. Um, this is a simplified version of the received power from an antenna. Now, we'll write, write that, rewrite that in a second. Okay, so we've just we just derived that the between two antennas, PR received power is the transmit power times the transmit gain times the received gain 
times lambda squared over 4 pi r squared quantity squared for each transmission equation. Oh. So now if you want to um, measure the gain of an antenna, let's say you have an antenna you know the gain for. Well, there's a two what's called the two antenna method, where this is the gain of your standard. We'll call this G, we'll still call this GT, right? And you measure the distance between them, and you measure the power received. And you know the power transmitted somehow. So then you have, you can compute the gain of the receive antenna from PT for PR. Okay, that's just one over the loss um, or attenuation times, um, sorry, I got that backwards. It's PR over PT. Okay, so it's the loss. That is the loss, okay, times 1 over, times 4 pi r squared over gt lambda squared. So If you know the gain of one antenna, you can compute the gain of the other just by measuring the, now there, I'm, this is oversimpl, I should say this is oversimplified, and we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But what if, you, what if you don't have any antenna that you know the gain for? Well, all is not lost. Let's say you have three antennas. And one of them is what's called reciprocal. In other words, its transmit gain and its receive gain is the same, which most antennas are. Some aren't. So you measure three pairs of antennas. Okay, you got three pairs of antennas. Well, here you've got the received power is equal to PT, GT, G1, G2, lambda squared, or 4 pi r squared, or, well, 1, 2 squared. You can even make all the distances a little different. Okay, here the received power is PT, GT, G1, PT, G1, G3 lambda squared over 4 pi r squared. Here, 1, 3, P received is PT, G2, G3 lambda squared over 4 pi r 2, 3 squared. Well, what have we done? We now have three equations and three no unknowns. You actually can solve for each of, the, each of the gains for each of the antennas now. You don't have to know the gain of any one of them. You've computed the gain for all of them. Um, and uh, you can look at that in, in one of our courses. Uh, and, and we'll uh, talk about that maybe later. So, so you don't even have to know the gain of an antenna to, to of if you have three antennas you can figure it out now there's something interesting so there's a one two antenna method you know one and you don't know the other three antenna method you don't know it but i'm going to make a little proposal what if you have four antennas so you have an antenna 1 antenna 2 antenna 3 and antenna 4 And you want to measure some, well, the first one, you'd measure this pair, this pair, and this pair. That would give you one antenna measurement. That would give you these three gains. Well, okay, 
This one, you could use these two antennas and measure another pair. But if you make one more measurement, something interesting happens. If you measure this pair with four antennas, all of a sudden, each antenna is a member of three separate measurements with only one extra measurement now. Say so this antenna, you have this measurement, you have this measurement, and you have this measurement. So you can do two things with that. If your shop measures antennas, with four antennas, you can get some statistics. And you can do some um, uh, error correction because you, you, can, you can determine if there was an error made in the measurement through this. Okay, but to, to, in order to uh, dispel some ideas that this might be an easy thing to do, this was outrageously oversimplified. As they say, the devil's in the details. Their, their, their one problem is multipath. When you're making antenna measurements, multipath is always a problem. You've got to deal with that. Proximity is a problem. That's because the, the, the free transmission equation is only in approximations when the antennas are sufficiently far apart. So if you're close, that means that, that use some other propagation equation. Um, another problem is impedance mismatch effects. You've got to know the impedance of both antennas in order to do this correctly. And that, like I said, uh, polarization's involved. If there's a mismatch in polarization, that could be a problem. Mechanical measurement's a problem. They need to, you have to have accurate mechanical alignment of the two antennas. One of the problems with, with your measurement system, you're t when you, when you get, because of the 1 over r squared nature of the power, the farther apart you get, the less power is received and the less sensitivity you have, the more errors you have. But as you get farther and farther away to eliminate uh, proximity problems, you get sensitivity problems. Also, as you get farther and far away, away uh, reflection problems become more important. As they come in, multipath might be a problem. There might be interaction between the antennas if they're too close. Like I say, the devil's in the details, um, but you get some conceptual ideas how you might measure an antenna here. Okay, I hope this worked out better. We've recorded this multiple times, um, but yeah, we're learning. So if uh, you would like to see any, us cover any particular topic, uh, mail us at suggestions at learningmeasure.tv and uh, we'll try to put it on the show. Or if, if you want somebody interviewed or you want to learn something specific about something, same thing. If you are a vendor willing, wishing to have a demo your product or um, sponsor this show, give us an email at vendors at learningmeasure.tv. Um, finally, if, if uh, uh, you're in the Las Vegas area and you want to join our consultant network, uh, we would love to interview you here. Uh, this was our first one. Hopefully it will be better than this one. Um, or So let us know at, uh, well, suggestions at learningmeasure.tv would be good. Okay, uh, don't know what we're going to do next week. Uh, I'm hoping we'll have a, a, a real, another interview, um, on a di but maybe not uh, the same type of interview. Um, but let us know what you want to do. Okay, thank you. Goodbye.